Hey there, it's Coach Tim, Spider Cave Studios, Torrance, California. How are you today? I wanted to introduce to you somebody who is literally a hero of mine, made a big difference in my life going back to the, uh, the, the mid-90s. I was in a really dark place in my life. Uh, I decided to get back to my roots. Uh, you know, I was making bad decision after bad decision, and I'm like, man, i got to get back to, to what uh, brought me to the dance, and, and I got back into weightlifting. Uh, that I had done, obviously, as a, as a player, a uh, football player way back in the day. Going through a divorce, uh, it was more of I want to meet girls and look good, <laughs> uh, motivation this time. And so I found a book that was, in my view, is, is way more than just uh, bodybuilding and, and, and getting lean and stuff. And the name of the book I'm holding right now is Big Beyond Belief by Serious Growth the most effective muscle producing program ever. And I just want to introduce my guest by reading the first part of the introduction because I, I think it's, uh, it, it starts a really cool story. So a, a training model, a new roadmap, in the beginning there was the training routine. A friend, trainer, or maybe it's just somebody you happened to meet in the gym told you this is the way I do it, and you figured, hey, why not give it a try? It was a lot like stopping some guy on a street corner and asking him how to get to New York City. He would give you the directions on how he got there, but you didn't know if these were the best directions. You just figured if you followed them, you would get there someday. Unfortunately, a lot of people got lost on the way. And so in the late 80s, Optimum Training Systems perfected the first training strategy for the bodybuilder. As members of the first group of Americans ever invited behind the Iron Curtain to view Eastern Bloc training techniques, our eyes were open to a whole new weight training approach by the Bulgarian Olympic weightlifting team. And ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to, in like to introduce the author of this book, Leo Costa, welcome. Uh, thanks a lot, Tim, and thank you for having me on your show. I first have to uh, address something. I, you know, I love getting compliments. Just don't get me wrong, but when <laughs> you put me in hero hero status, I mean, oh my goodness, man, there's a lot of pressure now. I don't know if I can handle it. I, I got to go back to my big beyond belief mindset to be able to, <laughs> to to perform here. No, I appreciate that. That's awfully nice for you to say. Well, it's, you know, we, I don't know if I've ever shared this uh, in, our, in our talks. Uh, we've only really known each other for probably the last month, and I hope to get into how we met. But uh, what I really took away from the book, besides just amazing things that caused me to grow, I mean, people were accusing me of steroids. I've, I've never uh, done drugs of any sort in my whole life. Uh, in fact, I, I just recently went to one of those CBD stores, and I, I felt like I was really, you know, really <laughs> being devious, you know. I'm, I'm <laughs> and, uh, I know. But CBD oil. And, uh, but what I found from your book that, you, you know, I, I think great lessons in life are, can be generalized into other contexts. And so the thing that I took away that is the difference that makes the difference um, uh, if you can make it only one word, and that's the word novelty. And and so anybody that has followed me in in my marketing and my, my business con uh, counseling and, and content, I always use the word novelty, use novelty. And, you know, that's what draws people in, uh, novelty in our relationships, you know. Um, when I've uh, when I talk to my kids, they already know what I'm going to say, right? So you got to you got to switch it up. You know, <laughs> they are right. they're already playing the program on you, and 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 right. so you know, same in a marriage, same. Oh my God, I, when I coach football, I always I counsel coaches. You know, after after one month, these kids are already zoning out when you when you talk to them, and you have to do things that are novel and we'll do things like flipping the schedule around and all kinds of stuff. So, so Leo, that's, that's why you're, you're a hero because you, you have colored beyond just me understanding weightlifting to some extent, but in training, uh, excuse me, I'm using the wrong words. I know you like training as, as your word for it. 
Right. But uh, that's that's why I call you a hero. And uh, how did how did all this happen? You know, I, I I understand you grew up as a dairy farmer. What's up with that? Well, the you know it's funny how I got into this thing because I as an athlete, and again you have to go back to in this case the eighties. 82 now when I started bodybuilding. But when I was in the sport of football in this case, the back in those days, the coaches, they didn't want the guys that played the, they call them the specialty positions, quarterback, receivers, mainly. They didn't want us in the gym uh, training. And so I really had no, uh, you know, any experience in that area just because our coaches just didn't want us in the gym. And I actually didn't start training and got into the weight room uh, until I was about 25 years of age. And the reason for that was because I was getting married. It's funny that you said that when you're coming out of your uh, divorce that you wanted to do it to look good. Well, you know, I kind of did the same thing now that I'm thinking about this with you. And I thought, well, the hell, I got to kind of look good in that tuxedo, you know, for my <laughs> wedding. So I got into it right there at that point. Of course, I mean, I just, I really knew nothing about it. Just, you know, it's more or less at that point, it's kind of like uh, hearsay and, you know, uh, from some of the buddies that you saw weightlifting in the gym, it was just really, you know, it was, when you look back now, it's kind of like, you know, you're probably lucky that you didn't get hurt. Right. Uh, actually, but that's kind of for me where it started. And then it just, Okay, so I made it through my wedding and all that. And then it, the next thing I know, I'm two years into being married, and all of a sudden I'm in the worst shape of my life at the age of 27 uh, mm-hmm. because I'm on, a, I'm on a family dairy. I really didn't know what I wanted to do in my life, so I went back to something safe. And, mm-hmm. you know, and so I went to on the dairy business, and, well, I was working my ass off, and the next thing you know, I was out of shape, man. And one of my buddies that hadn't seen me for a long time, he's a childhood friend. He just looked at me and he goes, what the hell happened to you? I said, what do you mean? You know, you don't notice sometimes how, how, what kind of condition that you're really in because denial sets in and, you know, I'm not so bad looking, you know, until somebody puts you in your place like that. And that really, that, that shook me, shocked me a little bit. And he said, what, why don't you just get in the gym and start lifting? So that's kind of where it started started with me, you know, and um, I, being on a dairy, I knew how to weld and I made my own equipment, very, very prehistoric looking, but it was good enough for where I was at that point. And then about six months after doing that, uh, Tim, it was like the bug bit me. And I took, I took photos of me at the six month mark and it was a crack up. Um, I took wow. photos in like just my underwear and I'm thinking I'm all big and, you know, I'm thinking, yeah. I look back now and I thought, oh my God, but it didn't matter. The That's bug cool. bit me that way and it got me into the uh, the gym that was down the street and one thing leads to the other. The guy that was actually the, the trainer there that was helping people, spotting people, well, he mentioned to me that I should get into a bodybuilding competition. Turns out that guy has, has been my business partner now for close to 30 years. That was how our relationship started, and that was how when I began my relationship with weight training as opposed to weight lifting. I didn't know that at the time, uh, Tim, because it takes a while to learn how to train versus weight lifting. And unless you have an instructor or a personal trainer, which in those days at my hometown, there was no such thing as a personal trainer. The closest thing that we had was a aerobics instructor, but no personal training. So, you know, I, you, I'd be getting my information mainly from, you know, uh, an ex-football player. But Russ, he had already, that's a, the partner of mine that told me that was working in that gym that told me I, sh- I should compete. He had done one show, and he was just, just uh, adamant about the fact that I should compete in a show. And I'm thinking to myself, wow. I mean, I used to drop classes in college if there was anything that, to do with, um, you know, getting up in front of a class to uh, to do a presentation, let alone putting on on uh, speedos and getting in front of a bunch of people that are going to judge you. Yeah, uh, that's, so it was that's just, rough. You know, you know what I mean? It's like the last thing. But I tell you what, uh, the long and short of it was I did that show, and that's when the big bug bit me 
because after that, I knew that I just knew immediately, Tim, that that's exactly what I wanted to do for the rest of my life, even though there was no one doing it. Um, I just knew it because uh, I, I think we, uh, listen, we all have our story in life, and I think we all go through stuff, and life's going to test you, and, and no matter who you are, I think mm-hmm. we all have to face that fact. And, you know, I just I, I let myself down as an athlete, and I, I let myself off the hook, and I use an excuse like most people do. They have excuses for why they can't or why they don't. And I did that to myself. And, you know, some, I didn't realize how bad that was going to hurt, how bad that started affecting me. Like, you know, what if the what if thing started happening? What if I wouldn't just, cause I wanted to be a pro athlete is what my, my childhood dream was. And so when I let myself down, you know, at first it didn't bother me, but then as time where goes on, it was like, holy crap. What could I do at that point? I, I'm married with kids, and, you know, it's not like I can go back and, and try to become a pro athlete at that point. And yeah. so I came to the realization, I just told myself this, because it was the second best thing I could do. And I said, I made a promise to myself, and I said, if I ever get a chance to do something that creates that buzz that I had for wanting to be a pro athlete and all that went into that, all the practicing and all this, you know, you, as you know, cause you're, you're an athlete and a coach. It, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of, uh, um, discipline that goes into that, you know, to, to become that athlete. And, but that's part of the, you know, when you really love something, that's part of what turns you on. I didn't know that as a 25 year old kid, how that was going to impact me. And so all I'm sure a lot a of con- this, I'm sure, excuse me, I'm sure a lot of the self-realization, uh, at least for me, is I, I, I look back now at 55 and I'm, I'm like, oh, this is, this is why I've felt this way for all these years or I did this or whatever, right? It's, you, you sort of kind of figure yourself out <laughs> way down the line. Yeah, yeah you know, and uh, so all I can do is just promise myself that, I mean, that was a far-fetched promise to myself because it's like, I mean, if I really sat down and thought about it realistically, again, like I'm telling you, what the hell am I going to get into that gives me that buzz uh, except for the, uh, the fact that I could become an athlete, a pro athlete. Now, that was not going to happen. The chance of, of me becoming an athlete would be about the same chance I would have to fly a spacecraft to the moon. But nevertheless, I made the promise to myself, not knowing that down the road in a couple of years, and, uh, you know, how things work out sometimes. It's like um, my buddy and, and the comments that he made that all of a sudden I was bitten by that bug. And at first I really didn't know if I recognized that. You know, it's kind of hard to trust uh, intuition. I think we get a beat out of us um, in so many ways. And it starts at a very young age. Sometimes I think in school or maybe yeah. by parents that are have a way of thinking. You know, there's different reasons that happens, I think. I, I know. And I just didn't know if what I was feeling, you know, that buzz is like, okay, what is this? Why am I like really digging this? Why am I all of a sudden, even though I don't like to read, why do I have my nose stuck in pages of muscle and fitnesses and I can't get enough? I'm insane right now. You know, it just, it just kept getting well, worse well, in a well, really. Let, can I, can I interrupt? I want to stop you right there. Cause I've, I've been yeah. begging to ask you exactly that. You're, you're, you're an ex football player. Right, you played through high school and then you went to Pomona. You're a quarterback. You obviously yeah. were really good. If you if 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 even the idea of playing in the pros is is on the uh, on the radar, uh, in order to accomplish all that you accomplished, you had coaches, i.e., I. mentors. Did you once that bug happened? You know, you just said you you started tearing open the pages of the magazines like so many of us did. But did you go seeking real mentors? I mean, was Russ Harine, uh your your mentor, or, or you know, how did how did you go about this to get good? Well, as a matter of fact, that when Russ did tell me that, you know, all of a sudden it was like, you know, here's a guy who believes in me, and I, this is so far out of my my comfort zone. Me being a bodybuilder, really, you know. But but he, yeah, at that point, he took me. Between the comments that my childhood friend made to me and Russ, those guys were really responsible for the launching of my career, but especially 
Russ because he had some initial experience of that. He had competed one time. And, and, and as it turns out, Russ is like a, I mean, this guy's a human, uh, he's like a nerd in a great way. Uh, he's analytical and, you know, and yet he gets it. He's not uh, a boring nerd by any means not that they are, but he just, I mean, he really knew his stuff. He, he gave me confidence and I, that I knew that he knew what he was talking about. And so, yes, he started the ball rolling for me that way. And he turned me on to different ways of training based on what he knew and diet. But you know something, Tim? Here's the thing. And I just did a, a podcast just recently, and we talked about this. At some point in this relationship that you have, whether it's a mentor or a coach, at some point you have to be willing, as the athlete, you have to be willing to do the work yourself. Uh, you simply having somebody there because I see this as a problem with so many athletes and even people that I've trained over the years, they, and, and professional bodybuilders, it's amazing that I just, I did some interviews with some pros that they just didn't really know exactly what they were doing to get the result because they put their hands totally in their mentors. So I'm not saying that a mentor isn't necessary, but when you don't become a part of that relationship and you take it on and become responsible for your own results, Meaning it doesn't matter that you don't like to read. It doesn't matter that every time you go into the damn gym, this is with regards to bodybuilding. It doesn't matter that it's painful. It doesn't matter that you're sick. It does, none of that shit matters when you, when you make the decision to become a bodybuilder. And it's not that unusual in athletics. When you make that commitment and you want to go to the top, these are the things that you have to be willing to tolerate. And, but Russ was definitely an important part of my career in that respect. I recently uh, counseled a player, and it's a little bit over the top, uh, which is not unusual for me, but I, I, I asked him, I said, are you willing to die on the field in order to play and start for this team? If you're not, then get the hell out of the game. You're, you're wasting other people's time. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it, it was kind of a wake up call. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's not little pee wee football. It's, it's not a little pee wee bodybuilding. If you're competing and you're amongst the, the real deal, you, you, this is what people do that, that want to win. And so, yeah. you, you, right? And, and, and uh, so I, that's interesting. So, <clears throat> what is the relationship? of, say, a, a trainer with a, a, a competitive bodybuilder. You said some of these guys don't ever really learn why they're, they're getting better when, in fact, if, I think what I hear you saying is, is when they learn why, you know, the, the difference that makes the difference and, and, and to get, say, their, their chest or their biceps big uh, and shaped a certain way, uh, wouldn't it help them if they knew why? Because then, then the trainer could actually take them to the, that next level. Yeah, and uh, here's here's the thing that I learned about being a, a really great trainer. I think is that my job is not to make you codependent upon me. My job is to make you successful. That when you go out, out on your own and do this, I'm looking at the end result, and that is not necessarily me being a part of their ending or overall success down the road. And if I'm that person, then that's fine. But I know I want to make sure that I'm that guy that's not the, you know, the, the trainer that's necessarily the yes person. I'm the guy and the person that says, look, you know, even though you're this athlete, I trained a baseball player, a pro baseball player many years ago who came to me for my service. And it turned out that I learned a great lesson from him actually. And you know what? The guy was making a lot of money, and he'd been trained by, uh, you know, he did his own thing and, and had some experience with training. And, you know, this guy, all he did was try to tell me how I should train him, even though he came to me for my expertise. And I learned a great lesson right there. Go ahead. He wasn't coachable. Uh, at that point. And I had yeah. to make a decision right there. And, and what I did is... I called it putting him over the ledge. 
Um, because I've explained to him that those things that I was doing with him or weren't mainstream necessarily, but they were effective. But you know some Tim, you know this as well as I do as an athlete and sometimes even coaches. Um, when you have, when you're very strong in your mindset and you're unwilling to expand that horizon, sometimes you get too caught up in thinking that one way is the only way. Yeah. And so I had a, I had a, make a decision at that point with this guy. And I called it, I wrote about it many years later. I called wiping the slate clean. I had a, I had to wipe his slate clean, what he knew and what he learned from the past. Cause I had a coach tell me one time, Eric Widmark, he was the offensive coordinator. I just talked to him by the way, not too long ago, but I remember one time saying, well, coach Widmark, we used to do it this way. This is how I learned how he did it. And that he, boy, he straightened me out right away. He goes, I don't give a damn how you learn this in your past. You are here now. You are learning from me. So he got my attention that way. And it, he wasn't that coach that it was like, here's where no way. He had, a, he had to get me to a point where I was coachable, as you're calling it. Yeah. And that's what I did with this baseball player. And what I did in this case, I put this guy through some body through space exercises, which he thought was a crock. And I put him over the edge where he was tossing his cookies. And from that day forward, he didn't question me like that again as far as him thinking that he was a professional when it came to me training him. It changed that relationship. And that taught me something about when I work with people. What you think you want and what you need may or may not be the right thing. It's my job to make sure that I – I instruct you and I put you on the path that gets you overall result. But you have to be a part of that relationship. I want you to be a part of that relationship because if I'm out of the picture, I'm a shitty trainer unless you're successful when you keep moving forward without me. That's my goal. That's my, my goal. And it's just like that with my, in my training studios. I love having a clientele and the thought of them needing me for, I mean, forever would be great job security, but that doesn't make me happy. What makes me happy is me teaching them and training them, teaching them to go on. If they come back and they want to keep using my service, beautiful. I don't know if I answered your question because I start rambling. That's but. beautiful, man. Uh, it, it, I, I think there's a reason why we get along so because that's my philosophy in my business with my clients as well as with when I'm coaching. I, I always tell my coaches, love the players. I love my players, and that means yeah. I'm not going to just – teach, uh, you know, give them a fish, I'm going to teach them uh, how to fish, right? And so right. Uh, uh, John Wooden, had, I had listened to an interview of him years ago, and it's something I love. The, uh, he, he mentioned uh, one of his mentors, Amos Alonzo Stagg, who at one time, way back in the old days, was the winningest college coach of all time until I think Bear Bryant broke it and then someone else did. And uh, But anyway, Amos Alonzo Stagg was also a coach at my school, Pacific, up in Stockton for a while, and <clears throat> everything name, was named after him. And they had a winning season, and at the end of the winning season, the, the press went to, to him and said, uh, Mr. Coach Stagg, you know, what do you think about your, your, your player's success? And he says, I won't know for another 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. And I... I love that, you know, and yeah. um, it, it sounds like what you're doing. You know, we jumped way ahead. We went from the book and and a, and uh, in divorce to to training yeah. uh, today. Um, I I wanted to get into a little bit of of the marketing side and and you know it was a lot rougher than what you've shared so far. Your story, you. You get into you 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 get into bodybuilding, and then you make the trip to Bulgaria. How's that all happen? And then how do we end up with you know Timmy opening up a, a box uh, in the mid '90s? Well, here's the thing: the um, it was a leap of faith, pretty much. And I will tell you that that trip to Bulgaria was the idea of Dr. Horan. Okay, mm. and you know, going over to a country where Olympic lifting is king, you know, you're, you're making a good point. It's like, how do you connect those dots? Well, yeah. it's, a leap of, it's a leap of faith. It's what we did know about these countries in general. And I, I 
and by countries I mean at that point it was Bulgaria, uh, Russia, and Czechoslovakia, is we knew that those countries dominated the world in Olympic lifting. There's something to be said for that. You know, when you're at the top of your game, no matter what it is, you know, as I learned, there's some common denominators that take them to the top. You know, even though they, in this case, Bulgaria was the one that that actually became the most um, amazing in terms of information because what I learned from them was they had all the information about how to put on muscle. So I said, so why aren't you bodybuilding? Nobody, nobody at that time was bodybuilding over there. Yeah. And they said, the, the Olympic lifting is the way that we brag to the West because in those days, uh, Tim, they were socialistic. They were just coming out of communism. Yeah. And they said, it's a way for us to brag to the West, which I thought was just, you know, I never thought about shit like that. And, and, and they said, and as far as athletes are concerned, it's a way for them to be able to be a rock star and to travel. Otherwise, they're pinned in. That's a oh, wow. harsh reality. Yeah, wow. that's a harsh reality. So I thought that was interesting. So, and I told them, I said, look, I, the reason why I'm here as an American is because I want to learn your, all your, your training techniques and all your secrets, if you have any, because I want to go, you know, I want to write a book in bodybuilding. And they were not phased by that one bit. And I'm still sticking with the Bulgarians here at this point because they were the ones that were just really forthcoming as far as information was concerned. They had no issue with that. I said, are you sure? They said, yeah, <laughs> we're, no, we're no problem with that because by the time he said, we're eight years ahead of you. You probably don't realize that, but we're eight years ahead of you. I'm thinking, no way. You know, I'm an American. We're, we're number one in everything as far as I'm concerned. You know, yeah, that's, right. not actually, that's not actually true. I mean, we have a great... You know, we're number one in a lot of things, but not in everything. Right. And uh, so they said, well, you know, we're eight years ahead of you. And, you know, by the time you take this information back and do whatever you want with it, doesn't matter to us, uh, we'll be way down the road on to something else. And these guys taught me about how to think outside the box. These guys taught me how to um, do application first and instead of um, uh, theory, because that's a major distinction. Some people, I don't know if they really realize that, because in our country, we, we have a tendency of being more theory-based first and then going to the people that do application and say, look, in theory, this is how you should train to put on muscle versus we go into the gym, this is the Bulgarians, and what is the stated goal? Because I think that's so important to have is a really clear stated goal. In their case, it was about developing the strongest men in the world. And they said, then we go into this, what's well, a gym. It's got all this equipment. And how do we, now the stated goal is how do we make these men the strongest men in the world? We have to figure this stuff out through trial and error, through thinking outside the box until we get the results that, that we're looking for. Once that happens, and then we bring theory in and we say, look, we know it works. Now you tell us why. I thought that was a great distinction, and it just turned my mind around at that point because that made me never, ever again uh, afraid to try something that was maybe totally off the wall and that goes against popular belief. And that sort of mindset and and philosophy carried on when we wrote our training courses, we were counter popular in some cases in the way we presented our information because it was, it went against the grain, the main sort of the mainstream. You probably would know that. Yeah. Yeah. That is wild. Let me ask you something. This was the Olympic, this is Olympic lifting. So for the audience that is not familiar, can you explain what it is? And, and do we lift differently as a bodybuilder, as an Olympic lifter, as a power lifter, as a baseball player, as a football player, are, are there differences? Specifically, there are stark differences, but they, you know, so much of the training goes together. By that I mean, for example, when you're a, a power lifter, power lifters are, and even Olympic lifters, their training is more specific to strength, whereas a bodybuilder is more specific to muscle growth. 
where I was under the misconception was I thought back then, it's, it's still a debate today, that I thought that lifting heavier put on muscle more effectively than lifting lighter weight and more repetitions. But specifically, and the key word here is specifically, volume training puts on muscle faster than strength training does. Strength is a secondary benefit. Just like the people that are, are training to be the strongest men in the world, be it a powerlifter or an Olympic lifter, they train for strength with a secondary benefit being they add muscle to their body. Does that make sense? Yeah, if you can explain volume. Volume is doing more reps and lighter weight. Whereas, in other words, uh, well, let's just say volume uh, would say anything above six repetitions all the way to 100. That's volume. Whereas so, anything, be anything below like five reps or less, that's strength and explosive power type training. To, to talk of, take this to the extreme, um, and I may, my memory may be fuzzy, but I believe I heard on the, uh, one of the tapes way back when, didn't Tom Platts do like a thousand squats or something like that at one point? Yeah, he did. Yeah, he, I think I was a nut. He actually, <laughs> there's a guy right there that you talk about outside the box uh, training. Uh, he was curious. You know, this is what I liked about Tom, and I realized that, you know, the people that ran it to that extent, we're all curious, and we wonder what happens if. Tom actually put on uh, 135, and he wanted to see how long he could actually squat. And he went 15 minutes straight until he passed out. That's Tom Platts in a nutshell. <laughs> That's so, awesome. And I said, the 1,000 rep thing, I don't know. But it wouldn't surprise me. Let me tell you that about Tom. He was the scariest person I ever trained with to this day. Is that right? Oh, shit. I mean, you know, and I didn't, I mean, I learned really early on uh, when I went to Gold's Gym. And, and, and again, if I'm getting off track, just, just shut me down. But uh, oh, we were, he decided that uh, he was going to take me on under his wing to help me for, to get to the next level. And of course, you know, he was known for his legs and squatting. <laughs> so we go into the uh, Gold's Gym. Venice, the Mecca, and yep. he puts on three, three plates on each side, 315 on each side. And I, I think about this all the time. And he, you know, I didn't know Tom that well. I, I kind of did, but not when it came to actual training with him. And, you know, he said, yeah, we're going to squat today. And he goes, I'm not feeling too good. And I'm a little bit achy. And then he cranks out like 25 reps. And I said, oh, okay, I know what's going on here now. You know, <laughs> he said, set, he's setting me up for failure, you know? So no, Tom was, uh, yeah, he was just, in his mindset and the way he trained was like that all the time. I mean, uh, it was scary. I, I was never afraid to train like I was with him, but I did it anyway because I knew that, you know, he was going to teach me something and I was going to learn something, sure as hell I did. Well, that's, that's uh, one of the reasons I wanted to bring it up was the mentorship again, mentorship. Yep. And why you know uh, the personal training is so important. Let, let me uh, let me <clears throat> let me get uh, back to the book and the the uh, production that you you created and, and how it ended up uh, in my hot little hands. Because as uh, I've said this before, uh, you know I, I think it was like fifteen, one of those old school fifteen or. Uh, 20 page sales letters that I, it was a free report, I think probably one of those three or four step uh, direct response deals that you would see in a magazine. And then you guys sent me this letter that sold me and I, I sent off the check or the credit card or whatever it was back then. And, and I'm waiting, I'm all this, you know, and I get the box and it's like Christmas day, man, I'm ripping it open <laughs> and it's kind of a, decent sized box and it has you know the the main book and a few other books and and three or four or five videos of of you and Harine and also with with Tom Platt and uh I was like in heaven and it and so it was great marketing how did that happen though I mean did you just like oh I'm gonna write this letter and and, uh, you know, put an ad in, in one of the magazines and, and guys like Tim will, will find it. What, how does that magic happen? I wish it was that easy. Um, first of all, Big Bad Belief was our third 
I don't know if it's the right word, iteration or the third sort of the evolution of training courses that we wrote. The first one that we wrote was Bulgarian Burst, okay? And oh, that's, that's right. Yeah, and then the second one that we wrote was Serious Growth, and then there's Big Brown Belief, Titan Training, and we have a new one coming out in March. I can't really talk about it just yet. I'm going to tease you about that. Anyway, oh. so what, what happened was, again, i got to give credit to where credit is due. Harine, the nerd, he's always uh, studying stuff like this, you know? He said, because uh, I, when I came back from Bulgaria, I said, Russ, and this is where I think my strength is, is I'm pretty in, in, intuitive. I just kind of feel stuff. I said, even though I, I came back from Bulgaria with information that you would think would be more specific for Olympic lifting, I said, I think we have something here, you know, for bodybuilding. And, of course, we, you know, we tweaked it uh, a little bit to make it more for the bodybuilder. But based on the Bulgarian principles at this point, three times, I think our first uh, Bulgarian burst, we had people training three times a day, and we knew that that wasn't going to be, I mean, this is when we uh, already took a stance that was counter, uh, you know, counter popular. What the hell? Uh, you you got to be kidding me. You can train three times a day? I mean, we knew that for most people, it wasn't going to be user-friendly, but we didn't care because the stated goal was to put on the the most muscle that you could humanly put on. That was a stated goal. Yeah. So once we once we got it to that point, then Russ said, "Hey, there's this guy in uh, in in L.A., Jay Abraham, and I'm sure that you've heard of him. And if you haven't, uh, you know he was like this genius marketer. Um, and Jay Abraham, Russ and I, you know, to try to get into have a guy like this, Jay ended up writing that letter that you got, the 18 or 16 page uh, direct mail piece." But boy, I tell you what, he made us earn that meeting with him, uh, Tim. He turned us down. I can't tell you how many times. And we just wouldn't let off because we just really believed in what we had in our hands. You know, this is when you, when you know something, I just think it's important just to stop right here. When you really feel that, that you just, you know, sometimes you think, I just know this with all my heart that this is going to happen or this is so, you just know it. Yeah, and that that's where we were, and we just wouldn't let off that because we should have. I mean, we got turned down so many damn times. Jay just finally just said, "Well, fuck, just have." Him. Oh, so I hope, hopefully, I didn't just mess up your podcast by cussing like that. But <laughs> oh, good. Um, um, he uh, Jay just finally said, "Just come down." And at this point, he had just uh, finished with a uh, doing marketing uh, for Icy Hot. Most people, or a lot of people, should know about that product. Pretty famous a popular product back then. Yep. And he just said, just, just come down. And, you know, looking back, I don't know if this is part of Jay's uh, tactic with us, but he said, just come down. And he goes, I'm going to give you a, a meeting with me. And so that's how we got into Jay. And, and Tim, we had to make a decision, Russ and I. Because after that meeting, Jay goes, look, I can tell you guys really are passionate about what you do. He asked, he did some fact finding. He says, is there anybody else in the industry that's doing bodybuilding because Jay doesn't know much about bodybuilding, you know? Yeah. And so, and when we said yes, I thought, well, this, we're done now, you know? And Jay go, that's good because we don't want to invent the, uh, the wheel. We want to make it better, make a better widget. So I'm thinking, okay, we're still in the game here. And then Jay said, so here's, I'm going to go ahead and, and take this project on, but here's what I need from you. This was a, a Friday that we went down there. By Monday, I need fifteen thousand dollars up front. I'll write you a fifteen or sixteen page. You know, he had this whole package that you know Jan knows knows this stuff. Yeah. And he said, "You guys do that, and we got a deal." So you know, and listen. At this point, Russ and I, when Jay said that, we Russ and I, I'll never forget this. God, I forget most of my a lot of stuff, but not this. I guess because it's traumatic at that point. I looked at Russ, and he looked at me, and we go, deal. Well, Tim, we didn't have money. But what we had were about 30 credit cards. <laughs> and we took, cash, we took cash advances on most of them. That's how we got this damn thing started with Jay. And I'll tell you what, our wives were raising hell with us, but it oh, didn't I, matter. I... No, it didn't matter because we believed in this so much. It was like. You know, if we, boy, if we failed, woo, there was going to be some massive hell to pay. 
But so we got the, we went back down there on a Monday, gave Jay the 15 grand. He wrote that letter and that particular ad in a long, in a long nutshell there, it ended up selling 990 copies, uh, 990,000 copies. That yeah. one free, yeah, that ad, it was amazing. And we have so many people, uh, this is the reason why you got to trust, you know, your instinct. Because an 18-page or a 16-page direct mail piece, you know how many people told us, who in the hell is going to read that? Who's going to, how, how are you going to be able to keep somebody's attention to read that? Well, you hired the rest is history. Him, that's how. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the rest is history, you know. And, uh, in fact, it was so popular when we did a test run, because Jay taught us, you know, right at that point, he says, before you ever take a big, big uh, dive in the market, you need to test a new product. So you got to test this with so many. I think we tested it on maybe, I don't know, it seems like five or 10,000 people. Because he says, then we can find out, you'll know if you have a viable product. I mean, within days. You know, as being in the industry, that something like that either goes or it flops pretty immediate. Yeah. And, and, and we knew that. And Jay was very upfront about that stuff. And, uh, and well, lo and behold, uh, we got like a, a, I forget what the percentage was that made it a viable product. And that's the, that's the good and the bad news because now you had to play a bigger game. Now you had to go out and test the bigger list before you actually took the big dive, you know, in the big market. Well, we didn't have the money. We just we couldn't keep up with the, I mean, you know, you were talking about Christmas when you got our stuff. I have to tell you something. It was Christmas for us there for quite a while, but especially in the beginning, uh, the amount of money that we were getting through the mail back then, Tim, was insane. I mean, the, the <laughs> I couldn't even believe it. The yeah. post office were bringing like big sacks uh, people used to send like money orders back then and the mail is insane. And we were getting like $10,000 a day. And it was, it, I just couldn't even believe what was going on, but we couldn't keep up with all that. So what well, Russ and I, uh, we had to make a decision at that point. And uh, do you remember a guy by the name of Gary Halbert? Of course. Legend. Yeah, everybody did. Yeah. And uh, well, Halbert, uh, he, he agreed to take our product for one year. We, we negotiated the deal, and he marketed our product for one year. We took, I forget what the percentage was, but he had the lion's share. And But we made enough money off of sales that Halbert, you know, with his magic, did, that we were able to take our product back, the Bulgarian verse, and that's just how we started creating the rest of our, our products. That's, that's how that whole story started right there. You know? and, I, and I wanted you to tell. I'm glad you told it so detailed because it's a it's a, a story of grit. It's a story of of. I mean, like you said, you had the the, the intuition and the gut feeling, and and you're just we're going to make it happen. Come hell or high water, right? Exactly, exactly. Perfect willingness, baby. And how close does that relate to being in bodybuilding? You have to have perfect willingness. You know, so many so many things in life are kind of the same but different. Mm -hmm. You know, but I think they're just parallels, all kinds of parallels in life. And this is one, one parallel that was like, you know, our bodybuilding background was like we had perfect willingness then, and we had it with Jay. We just, it just, it just transferred across the board there. Uh, I'll tell a quick story. I, I, I actually met Jay. Uh, it's not as, as sexy as yours story, though. Uh, I was at a uh, a conference years and years and years ago, and it was when Jay had done a a, a a tag along with some internet marketing guys, and it was really his first venture into the internet. And uh, it was like a year long kind of tutoring thing, and at the end, it ended up at a hotel in L.A. And so. I had followed Jay for a long time, so I was really excited to go introduce myself and say hello. And, and you know, I, I live in Torrance. He lives at the time in Palos Verdes. His offices are down the street. Hey, we're kind of neighbors, you know, kind of thing. Yeah, and, yeah uh, that's true. And uh, as he's looking down on us in the, in the <laughs> <low> <laughs> Yeah. 
<laughs> and uh, so, so anyway, I went to him. He goes, "Oh, he's you know," and he's he's very gracious, very just just eloquent, you know, and and the way yeah. he behaves and and stuff. So we 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 talked, and you know, we, that was that. And then on the last day, he asked. Uh, he goes, "Hey, I know there's a lot of people, you know, have to get out on on." Um, uh, planes and get back to, to to home. So those that gotta leave, would you raise your hand? So I raised my hand, and he looked at me and he was like, "What are you doing? You live right down the street." And, <laughs> and so I said, "I said, well, um, I coach little, you know, youth football at the time, and we have a game. I gotta go." <laughs> and he goes, "Well, wait a minute. Who are you playing?" And I go, "Well, it's." this team up in Palos Verdes. And he goes, is it that Greek bull thing? I go, uh, yeah. He goes, my kid's on that team. <laughs> oh, no way. Yeah, yeah. It was, That's it was, crazy. Isn't that a small world? But it, it was kind of cute. But uh, So, look, you, you've got more grit to talk about because you, uh, you're riding the high life. You're doing your thing in bodybuilding you're, and all that. And then at some point, Something tragic happens three times. Uh, can you talk about that? Yeah, I uh, I decided that after a you know I basically retired from the sport, if you will, at the age of uh, about forty one, forty two years of age, and I was going through you know again I told you you know we all go through stuff in in our life, and at that point you know my my life it, it was great, and I don't I don't regret anything, believe it or not. But during those that time I was going through divorce and I had, you know, I don't know, this, I, it just took its toll. And, uh, so I, I, I got, I retired from it to focus on my business to make sure that I was, I stayed solvent and bodybuilding had to go away. Uh, yep. and that was that I competed at the worlds in, uh, I forget where, Belgium. Uh, wow. anyway, yeah. So 14 years, uh, later, 13 years later, I decided to come back at the age of, make sure this all makes sense. Uh, I was 42. Thir- what's 42 and 13? 52, I'm 55, 56. That's about right. Uh, I decided that I wanted to compete again. It was back. I, you know, I, I, when I left it, I left it, I thought for good. And, you know, I had a, I had a good run and I was, I was okay with that. But after about 13 or 14 years, uh Oh, that buzz, I, that little bug started biting at me. And oh, yeah. the next thing I, I knew, I was like, I'm going to compete again and see. I, and, and I just wanted to see, to be honest with you, I wanted to see if muscle really did have memory. I'm curious, you know, because, uh, Tim, when I was coming through the ranks, you know, we believe that. It's like, you know, make the mind and muscle connection and, okay, as a bodybuilder, you know, you eat this muscle dust, okay. And uh, you really so didn't thought, lift for that many years. You didn't train. No, I did not. I was like, and, and when I first went away from it, I actually was in protest. Don't ask me why. I was thinking like I had my head up my butt, but I, I think I know why. For so many years, and maybe you can relate to this as a bodybuilder, uh, you you sacrifice, you starve yourself. I mean, I was always competing like uh, around the first of the year. Uh, I was always dieting at Christmas and at the holidays, always, you know. So when I was all of a sudden done with that, and combine that with I'm going through a bunch of crap now in my life, you know. I have a sour taste in my mouth to begin yep. with. Yep. And I just said, you know what, screw this. I'm not going to train. I didn't train for eight months. I, was, I had a gym still, personal training studio. I refused to train. I refused. I will not do this. I kept telling myself. I don't know what kind of a game I was playing, but I was just rebelling. Yeah. Well, that was okay. And, again, it was my second time around. You know, I told you my buddy told me I was in the worst shape of my life at 27 years of age. Well, eight months after I just, you know, refused to do any training, I was going to – out beside my gym, I, across the street was a restaurant. And, I mean, at this point I had gained 80 pounds. Now – you can Boy. imagine if you're not if you're not working out, putting on eighty pounds, it's not going to be muscle. Quite the opposite. <laughs> and, and and again, I was in you know denial, like I was when my my buddy said, "What the hell happened to you?" Well, I caught a glimpse of myself as I was walking by a car. 
I, I got my reflection. And just for that split second when I looked over, you know, I just happened to look over. And for that split second, I thought, who the hell is that? It was me. You know, I said, oh, my God. I'm in horrible shape. Now, this is the all-time worst shape of my life. That shook me right there. I thought, okay, nope. And I made, again, I, I made a promise to myself because it seems like I do better that way. This is a way to hold myself accountable. I said, I'm not going to be like this ever again. Anyway, uh, so I get into to bodybuilding again. I decided to compete, and, man, the muscle had memory. I needed one more year. I competed at the Nationals, Old Man's Nationals in Pittsburgh, and I did pretty damn well. I needed one more year. Well, I came back in that second year. I was about three months away from my uh, doing that show again, the very same show. And unbelievably, I had a, I had two strokes back to back. I actually had three. Two were back to back, and one happened three weeks later. And I tell you what, you know, again, life is going to rock you. Life is going to create adversity. And that was my adversity, man. I mean, this was something that was just unbelievable. You know, the thing about, of course, you know, how, how could I possibly think that I would have something like this? An athlete all my life, a trainer, I'm helping people get in the best shape of their lives. I would have never thought sense. that when this is happening that that was a stroke or two, you know, until the until the doctor told me, he said, yeah, you've had two. And they, oh, you're they still gave going me a, around operating uh, normally, but you've had two strokes. Uh, I've had three, actually. And uh, so anyway, when that happened, you know, I, um, the doctor told me, he goes, look, we can give you this medication. It's called, it's a long, uh, there's a long word for it. And, but it's basically a clot busting medication. And while I was there in the hospital, jacked up because I couldn't talk and I was, you know, so, I mean, I could talk, but slurred and I was paralyzed on the right side. And they said, if you take this medication, um, there's a strong possibility that in two and a half days, you're going to walk out of this hospital like nothing ever happened. Or you could die from it because you bleed out because it's, you know, it's, it's clearing um, uh, these clots. And if you have like a pulled muscle, for example, and you're, you know, you could bleed out. Those are my options. And you know what's crazy about this? Wow. Is to be, yeah, to be in that state of mind. Like I knew I didn't want to be like this. And to have those options in front of me, man, I tell you. But I knew, I said, I don't want to be like this. I'm going to take that chance. So they gave it to me. Unbelievably, in two and a half days, Tim, I walked out of that hospital like it never happened. My doctor told me, he said, look, you do not realize how big of an assault that has just happened to your body and your brain. And they wanted me to stop uh, training for uh, four to six months. And I thought to myself, he's not talking to me. He's talking to somebody who's average, not me. So I just, you know, I just told the doctor, I just thought in my head, yeah, okay, 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 okay. I went home. And after about a week, I couldn't take it. I went back to the gym, and I just said to myself, I'm just going to go really easy, and I did. You know, I mean, I was just, I mean, compared to what I was, when I was training, I did nothing, really. It was just a few exercises, and, and all of a sudden, it was like about two weeks or so, hey, uh, seems like I'm going to be okay. And then when I was training one of my clients, then I knew, because the first time it happened to me, I didn't know what was going on in my body. I just lost function. It was like dominoes falling. And this time, the third time, I knew what was happening. The same thing happened three weeks prior. And I drove back. I, I drove, believe it or not. I drove back to the hospital, which was 10 minutes away. And I walked in, and it, it happened a third time. This time, Tim, because I had that uh, cot-busting uh, medication so soon, they couldn't give it to me. I had to rehab the hard way. And I was exactly the same way. I was paralyzed on my right side. I mean, it was so, man, I tell you what, you talk about being tested, you know, and the scary part was not knowing what the outcome is going to be because you don't know, you know, you don't, you really don't know how much you're going to come back. Um, well, you know, but for, I mean, but, for some people, they don't come back. My, my dad they, never came back. <laughs> it, it's, no, they don't. It's a scary thing. 
Yeah, in fact, the and one of the ways I had to deal with this because you know when something like this happens, obviously, all I could think about was, is this going to happen again? And this oh, is yeah. really interesting. Yeah, you know, and because it was either living my life in fear, and if I was going to live my life in fear, then I would be in a bigger prison than I was being paralyzed at that point. That's kind of how I looked at that. All that did was make me make a decision. And in my book, I ended up writing a book called Three Strokes in Three Weeks Saved My Life because it did, as well as bodybuilding, as well as my um, athletic background because it gave me that set, that warrior mindset, you know, that once I got past the shock, then that side of me started kicking in. It's like, okay, I'm not going to let this, I'm, I am not going to let this thing win. You know, you have to have, you know, a mindset like that to achieve pretty much anything, you know, because it's a huge obstacle, as you may uh, understand. Yeah. And But it was so weird. I'll, I'll never forget the time that I was laying there in bed. This is why after the, it happened the third time, and I went home after about four days, and I was pretty jacked up. And I woke up one morning, and what was really odd was I didn't know where my limbs were on the right side of my body. And I can't really explain in words to you what that feels like or what it doesn't feel like, but just not knowing where your limbs are in space. And what was so, I think what made it even worse is here you're, here's a guy that's a bodybuilder who was all about having full control of his body. And all of a sudden he didn't. That was scary, man. That was a wake up call. Um, but had, somehow, go ahead. I, I said it had to be. And, and the, the thing I'm hearing from you is, because of your training, because of, I mean, if you, if you look at your book, that it's, it's, it's a book of process, and that's the thing that I really kind of get from having talked to you. You, 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 like a lot of great athletes, you process stuff, you, and, and, and then you go back inside and, you know, you have your own demons that are going to tell you, you know, it's okay, you don't have to do this, and talk you out of, it, and and you've been to you know you've been to the fight so many times you were ready to to, to battle it but you had to do it from a mental a aspect I mean you had to go deep and and that that's what I'm saying it's it's heroic I mean because the the alternative is, really sucks well and you know and the thing about that is is all these tools that you end up learning you know and and God, you know there's just so many things that you as a person, you don't really understand that are life lessons that you're learning sometimes earlier on in your life. And then one of the things that I remember my coaches saying over the years when I was playing, I'm sure that you've heard this before, if not even if not said it to your athletes. And the coaches said, you know, when you got your, when you're up against the wall and you're getting your ass, uh, asses handed to you on the field, you have to dig down deep and believe in yourself. That's mm -hmm. all I heard, Tim, at that point. You know, I went back to that, that call it training, because that's exactly what sports ended up being for me was training for me for a tool to be used now. And then combine that with bodybuilding, because bodybuilding for me, as hard as, you know, as much dedication as I put in and discipline as I put into football in this case, because I played baseball too, but football, um, bodybuilding took that discipline and dedication to another level. It, was, it just was. It just it required more. It was a, a longer supper fest, I call it, uh, than playing football because you played two or three months, you know, out of the year, maybe six months. But then with bodybuilding, it was like a it was a year long thing when you're in a t competing twice a year every year for 15 years. It's, it was a different dynamic, but it was exactly the tool that I needed at this moment when I was paralyzed because mm -hmm. one of the things that I learned uh, after I, as I was recovering is I went out and found out why people are only 10% of people who have strokes make an almost 100% recovery, which is horrible. But there's some reasons for that. And one of the reasons is people just give up because it, it beats you down every single minute and every single second of the day. And who in the hell, it's just like, like bodybuilding. How long does it take to become a national level competitor? Think about how many thousands of reps that you have to do 
And, you know, that whole pro you talk about a process, that whole process. Well, when you think about who actually ends up on stage as a bodybuilder, it's a very small percentage of people because of that reason. They just can't handle the, you know, that process of years and years and millions of reps probably at the end of 15 years, you know. And so that was, that was what I used. And the Bulgarians <clears throat> were relative at that point in my life as they were, you know, 15 or 20 years prior. Because what I learned from the Bulgarians was repetition is the mother of skill. It's known as Wolf's Law, and um, the body becomes its function. Okay, that all started ringing, and, and they, I learned from them that it takes 21 days before your body starts adapting because that's the way your body, the algorithm of the way that your body adapts to a regimen is about 21 days. And this is all the stuff that I learned with the Bulgarians. Okay, so now I said, okay, I, I'm going to, I'm going to overcome this. And I went into the living room. My wife, she dragged me and helped me in there, which is, man, to have that happen. Boy, talk about jolt. Having somebody else help me. Oh, God. Anyway, so I sat down, her beside me, my paralyzed body on my right side, and I said, just move my arm for me. Move it. We're going to do 10 of these. That was my, the reps. And all I did, uh, Tim, was watch her move my hand. I took I said, I'm going to use their philosophy and what I learned there, that the body becomes its function. You teach it what you want it to do. And I'm going to do it for 21 days. And, uh, you know, this may sound crazy, Tim, but as I was watching her move my, my arm, again, what was, what was really odd was that I had no connection to the, to the muscle. I could just see her moving my, my hand towards my body like I was doing a curl, you know, but she was doing yeah. it. And I did it every morning. You have to have faith when you do stuff like this. You have to have faith that in bodybuilding that what you're doing is going to create a result. You have to have that faith. And then all of a sudden, something really strange started happening. The best way that I can describe it is that as I was getting closer to the three-week mark, all of a sudden, I felt like this energy from my brain started traveling down my arm. That's all I can tell you. It was like a, some kind of an energy. I can't explain it any other way. Tim, by the around 21 days, I knew that I was going to be able to move my arm. It was one of the things that we talked about in the beginning of the show. I just knew it. I yeah. knew it at the deepest level. And by golly, Tim, it was like all of a sudden that energy traveled down my arm to my hand, and I lifted my arm my hand to my arm. It was hard as hell to do, but I did it for one rep. It wore me out just to do that one rep. But at that point, because of what I learned from the Bulgarians, body becoming a function, repetition is a mother of skill, I knew that I was going to recover. I knew that I, was, I had at least a fighting chance. Now it was up to me to see how far I could recover. That's that story right there, man. And this is when I, I really learn about things like, you know, adversity uh, will do one of two things. It's either going to define you or destroy you. What I had still the ability to make that choice because I saw some people that couldn't, Tim, because I went down the road and I spoke, I've spoken to all kinds of stroke support groups to find out why people aren't recovering. Some people are just, they get blown out, man, to the point where they have no, very little or no function. I was lucky that way, you know, and um, in fact, even to the point where uh, I went against, uh, again, popular belief, and I trusted my instinct. I went to my um, doctor said I should go to a physical therapist. I went to the physical therapist, had my wife had to take me, and I went in there, and the physical therapist talked to me, very nice person, but all I got from them was they wanted to make me functional again. I left that that uh, first consultation. I told my wife, I'm never going back again. I mean, again, freaking out. I said, I can do this. If I didn't have the background, especially in bodybuilding at this point, because I had a lot of years under my belt with training and nutrition, yeah, it would have been stupid. It would have been foolish for me to make that 
that call, and it was still risky. It went against my doctor. It went against, you know, my wife. I said, I can do this. And fortunately, I made the right choice because I made 100% recovery. But I'll tell you what, man, it's a long haul. I still, they are, are so, you know, the fine motor movements are the ones that take it the longest. And no one can tell now by my, the way I talk or even my, you know, my body, the way it works. I can tell that there's still a little bit more for me to recover. But here's the good news, Jen. It's going to be eight years. Uh, actually, January the 27th coming up will be the, when I had my first two. And then February 13th. I'll never forget that because the day before Valentine's Day. That's what I get my wife for Valentine's Day. Lucky her. Um, that's going to make my eighth year. And I have to tell you something, which is really, really good news for people that are out there that have had this happen. If you get started early enough on your rehab, the window is open, as far as I can tell, for at least eight years, and I'm going to say forever, for you to keep making progress. It's, a, it's when you don't, it's when you stay idle. It's when you are, you know, when it's too hard for you to get up and do that next rep, you know, or do that, 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 that next rehab. I do rehab every single day to this day, Tim, and I'm 100% recovered. This shit never goes away, man. Wow. And it's all, the, it's all the little things that you can do for recovery. I still make breakthroughs, Tim. Little tiny breakthroughs that no one else can see or feel but me. And when I do, man, it, it brings me to tears, to be honest with you. Because I'm amazed at what humans can do when they put their mind to it. And that's a true story. And how many times have we heard that? And how many times did I say... When my dad said it to me, it's like, yeah, well, whatever. What the hell do you know? It's true. It's really true. Well, I, I and, hear, I, I, I hear. In you know, you've had the adversities, the trainings, all these years, and it kind of led up to that moment. To that was your next dragon to slay. And that's right. You know, and and the the thing that I hear lots in you, and why you know, as far as also you talked earlier about when you're training somebody, you really want them to be able to train themselves in a, in a way so that they can grow. And you right. you coached yourself through this thing, and you got curious, and 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 you got educated, and and God, eight years later in today's world. Uh, Man, the internet. There's this Google thing, and you could look up all yeah. kinds of cool stuff, you know. Yeah. But, yeah. Hey, I, we're we're starting to go long, but I wanted to give you credit for something else that uh, is kind of a fad these days. Uh, it works really well, but it is a fad, uh, if you want to call it that. It's it's um, uh, today we call it keto, but. Uh, after Atkins made the uh, the 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 uh, no carb thing popular in the 70s, I remember my dad was on that when I was like in kindergarten, and then all of a sudden uh, I get another letter from you about this uh, this high fat diet and and uh, and Doctor uh, what's his name Doctor D uh, I'm going to Mario Di Pasquale Di Pasquale and. No. Uh, I learned a whole thing uh, about that and, and how you manipulate. Uh, you use the, the 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 Atkins thing sort of and and high fat, and then you go off it and carb, and next thing you know, you look like you're on steroids. It was sick. <laughs> it was I know. sick. I mean, it was. It, uh, uh, it was, and I got to I got to tell you also, there was another thing uh, that uh, I, you know, when you read, you do these things, read the manual, you know, as as the computer geeks say, because uh, on that uh, the the diet, or I should say, the workout of Big Beyond Belief, I was on the four day thing, and uh, uh, and I was overtraining. And I was dating a girl, and all of a sudden, I'm just like like shaking cold, and I can't get warm. <laughs> yeah. And she, oh, I'll be all right. So I like muscle it out, right? And so then it goes away, and then and and uh, she ends up one day goes, we're going to the hospital. This, you know, this shit ain't right. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, I'll be all right. No, no, you're going. 
and, and she was a she was a nurse anyway, so she was being you know cautious. And so we go down there, and the lady go, and the lady doctor goes uh, and feels uh, you know swelling on my on my uh, whatever they're called the 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 um, uh, whatever the, the 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 flushing system we have for trash in our body, right? And I can't think of the name of it. And and she she feels a couple spots. She goes. Do you lift weight? Do you take steroids? I go, no. Do you lift weights? And I go, yeah. And well, how often? And she goes, you're overtraining, you idiot. <laughs> really? <laughs> and well, you know, I I might have squeezed in, you know, instead of four days, I might do five, and you know, and, yeah. and so forth and so on. And 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 so uh, yeah, I learned a big lesson, and then I go back to the, I go back to the book. And it talks about overtraining, and because um, I was questioning uh, her saying, "Well, oh, just keep lifting, but don't you know right. do it like at hardly any you know uh, exertion." And uh, <laughs> I'm in the book, and it warns you know don't <laughs> don't don't go beyond this stuff. And I'm like, oh yeah. God, I should have read the book better. But anyway, <laughs> um, hey, did, if I left anything out, is there anything else we need to cover? No, and what you were talking about, I think what you were experiencing a little bit was the adrenal uh, burnout. <clears throat> so that happened to me before. It sounds like they had some of that going on. It just it shuts your body down and <clears throat> low blood sugar and that kind of thing. That, and that's what you're talking about is part of the reason that we wrote, if you remember, we had a part in there called the Optimal Training Zone because yes. one of the things that we learned from the, some of the lifters, a lot of the lifters, is that they were chronically either overtraining or undertraining, and we use the analogy of, uh, of um, uh, think of it as the training zone being a road that you travel down, and you have these lines that are on each side of you that guide you. In other words, if you go past that line, you're going off the road both ways. Right. And it was about uh, putting on muscle as a combination of lifting heavier and also lifting with volume. And this is where guys were. You know, the people at that point, they weren't, they weren't communicating that in a way that made sense. So that, all we did basically in our training courses was create a, a platform or a strategy or a template that made sense physiologically uh, to train people. So if you think about what you were doing, you were overtraining. So you were driving on the road like a good boy in between those lines. And you decided that more was better, like a lot of people. Well, if this is good, more must be better. Of course, And right. what you did is you drove your ass right off the edge of that the line. And then it's like, oh, let's go to the hospital. And, oh, you're overtraining. So then you, what these athletes, are, now I'm being, I'm using like extreme sort of uh, uh, examples, analysis here. But then what guys would do after they went uh, across that line, then they would cut their reps down or cut their intensity down or cut their training down, well, that brought you right back into the, the road and you're in between the lines again. This is what most people are doing. And then all of a sudden you went out the other end of that line and you were under training. So bodybuilders and a lot of these guys were either over training or under training and they were spending very little time in the training zone. That's where we came up with that optimal training zone for guys like you. <laughs> Num numbskulls like me, they <laughs> 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 extra. That's awesome. Hey, uh, Leo, oh, yeah. how do we get in touch with you? You where where are you at? Your websites, your socials, give it to us. Uh, you can find me at uh, guaranteedfitnessplus.com or dfitnessplus.com. That is my uh, my website. That's probably the easiest way to find me. You can find me on Instagram under Serious Growth. Or Leo Costa Jr., you can find me there. Um, I'm mainly now doing podcasts. And, you know, my whole purpose now is to pass it forward like the Bulgarians did with me. And because that's how I'm relative in the industry as far as I'm concerned. You know, I'm 65. I'm just a, like Platt used to say, I'm an old guy having fun in the gym. And I still train every day. And, uh, and I'm in pretty darn good shape for my age. Uh, but I, I spend my time now podcasting to educate people and to learn from people. Listen, I just did a podcast today with a young personal trainer. The guy was legit, you know, and you, and you can always learn from people and you can always teach people. So you can find me at yeah, one of those places there and hopefully listen to one of my podcasts 
that air every Wednesday, and hopefully that makes a difference. And I will tell everybody that uh, it's if you're interested in 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 training, it's he's, he's, he shares a lot of good stuff, and also. Uh, you're still doing this, right? On the stories every morning, you give like sort of a tip of the day on on. Instagram. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm on. I do an Instagram post, and you know, and oh yeah, I'm still doing that kind of stuff. And I'm back in the the industry again. And um, and again, I'm not bodybuilding as a you know to do the sport, but I'm uh, now working with um, uh, uh, Denny Kakos. He's a guy that. Uh, owns Iron Man. He bought Iron Man out from John Balick. He um, mm-hmm. he started this IMBA, PMBA. It's a natural uh, bodybuilding organization. The guy's legit. They're they're doing a really good job as far as keeping the sport clean. I'm right in the middle of all that. In fact, I'm going to South Africa here in March to be at the event. I told him I wanted to be a part of this movement. I think it's a great thing that he's doing. So that's how I'm now participating and you know, being a part of this again. And, and I have to tell you something, you know, that buzz is back. It, it never went away, but that buzz is, is it, uh, I'm so lucky, Tim, I've told people before, I am so lucky to have, to be as excited about doing this stuff now at my age as I was when I first started. It's a, it's a, it's an amazing thing. Um, so I'm doing that now. And, and that's, that's what gives me the, the buzz now. Well, your passion is infectious. I'll tell you that. I can feel it on this side. So I'm excited for you. And uh, I wish you the very best and, and the best of uh, blessings. Um, and uh, get, get, uh, get done what you want to get done, man. You, you, you're an inspiration. Thank you, sir. I really appreciate you having me on your show, by the way. Oh, thank you.